Uh, welcome to the latest installment of our Oxford Brain Diagnostics guest speaker series. Uh, Oxford Brain Diagnostics is an Oxford University spin-out with a method for analysing brain MRI based on cellular structures. Uh, we're working towards a clinical tool for early detection of Alzheimer's disease uh, and other neurodegenerative diseases, which is to be used by uh, clinical services and drug developers for clinical trials. And we're joined today by Professor Clifford Jack, who is Professor of Radiology at the Mayo uh, Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He obtained his MD from Wayne State University School of Medicine in 1979 and undertook a fellowship uh, in neuroradiology from the Mayo Clinic in uh, 1984. Uh, uh, but beyond all of that uh, background, Cliff is best known for the eponymous uh, Jack Curves, originally from 2010, I think, uh, Cliff, and for his leadership of the NIAAA uh, research framework that uh, proposed the ATN biomarker-based classification system for AD, which has actually formed a very influential part of of what we've, of the perspective we've taken at Oxford Brain Diagnostics as well. Uh, Cliff has received uh, prestigious prizes across a remarkable breadth of organizations, including the Radiological Society of North America, the International Society of Magnetic Resonance and Medicine, uh, and the American Academy of Neurology. Uh, so uh, I believe Cliff will be talking to us today about the history and, and hopefully the latest iteration of his biomarker model uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And, and with that, it's over to you, Cliff. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, I always feel a kinship to the UK. That's where my ancestors came from. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, this is the, what I'll talk about, evolution of diagnostic guidelines for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, disclosures, nothing much to disclose, no personal compensation. So this is what I'll talk about. First, I'll describe a little bit my sense of the history of diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a slide that I like to use um, when discussing kind of early days of diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. It's a slide by my colleague in behavioral neurology, Dave Notman, and his sense of the state of uh, how people thought about uh, Alzheimer's disease in the early 1980s and why the early 1980s is relevant will become apparent in a second, but his, his sense of this is encapsulated in this slide. And the, the way people thought about Alzheimer's disease, specifically the relationship between clinical symptoms and neuropathology is the so-called two-state view. So the assumption was that if someone uh, had Alzheimer's disease pathology at autopsy, that person was expected to have been demented in life. Conversely, if someone was cognitively normal in life, that person was expected to not have any Alzheimer's pathology if when that person uh, came to autopsy. And the reason that view is relevant here is because that was the view, that was how scientists in the field viewed this relationship between pathology and symptoms um, in the early 1980s, which is when the first widely accepted, widely adopted diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease were formulated. These are the so-called NIN, CDS, ABRDA criteria, also known as the McCann criteria. And these criteria held that a diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's disease could be made in life after certain exclusions, whereas a diagnosis of definite Alzheimer's disease could only be made at autopsy. Unfortunately, what happened over time was that this critical distinction between probable and definite was dropped by almost everyone in the field. And what happened was then that an amnestic dementia that presentation became equated with Alzheimer's disease. In other words, a nonspecific clinical presentation became equated with one specific neuropathology. Now, what's the problem with that? This is what the landscape of the aging brain looks like from a neuropathologic standpoint at certain of a population, but also at an individual level. So beginning in the 1990s or so and continuing to the present, neuropathologic studies have very clearly revealed that in not only in demented people, people who are demented in life, but also people who are cognitively normal in life, but in particular, let's focus on people who are demented in life. Um, Alzheimer's disease certainly plays a prominent role, but there are many other neuropathologies. Um, alpha pseudocleinopathy, TDP43, vascular disease, brain disease, and so on. And all of these increase in prevalence with age. 
co-occurrence is the rule, not the exception. And all of these neuropathologies can be associated with dementia, either in, uncommonly in isolation, much more commonly in uh, together. So the notion that anyone pre who clinically presents with a classic quote unquote Alzheimer's disease phenotype has the disease and that is the only cause for those symptoms is fundamentally incorrect. But that notion has woven itself throughout the fabric of neurology practice for decades. So what is the answer to <clears throat> this problem? Um, and the obvious answer is biomarkers. And when did the, uh, to, to detect in vivo, what does someone have Alzheimer's pathology, yes or no? And the earliest biomarkers that were that are disease specific, of course, were um, CSF-based measures of uh, protein analytes uh, in cerebral spinal fluid. And I've highlighted in the top here one of the early papers by the group, um, by by the Swedish group, and in particular uh, Kai Bleno, who really was, as far as I can tell, if not the certainly one of the major early pioneers in this area of um, uh, biofluid-based diagnostics for Alzheimer's disease. The first um, uh, imaging, uh, uh, first imaging biomarker that was proven to be, uh, proven to work um, in people was of course amyloid PET, specifically PIP, Pittsburgh compound B, which was invented by Bill Clunk and Chet Mathis at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, so you can see some of the dates here, um, around 2000, early 2000s. And following the development uh, of disease-specific biomarkers, both fluid and imaging, um, many research programs around the world started to incorporate biomarkers into their longitudinal observational studies. Um, and the Mayo Clinic was no exception to this. But the expectation based on the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which was then and really still now is the fundamental, I would say, thematic driving force in the, in the field of Alzheimer's disease. The expectation uh, based on the amyloid cascade hypothesis was the downstream pathology, tauopathy, neurodegeneration, and clinical symptoms would follow closely in space, i.e. To topographically, and in time with amyloid plaques. So that was what people expected to find when biomarkers, particularly imaging biomarkers, which you'll, because topography is present in imaging, not in fluid-based biomarkers, that was the expectation. When people in the two, 2000s or early, let's say mid to late 2000s, started to routinely incorporate <clears throat> biomarkers into their longitudinal research cohort programs. Um, and these are some of the early amyloid PET images that were obtained at the Mayo Clinic. And what you can see on the left is that CU stands for cognitively unimpaired, a negative amyloid PET scan, AD dementia stands for someone who had the typical clinical syndrome. You can see a very abnormal amyloid PET scan, but you see this unimpaired individual with a very abnormal amyloid PET scan. So this directly flew into the face of the prevailing thinking at the time. This person should have been demented based on the amyloid cascade hypothesis. Furthermore, when we, so at Mayo Clinic, like other places, we didn't just do amyloid PET, we did other, we did multimodality uh, imaging in our uh, um, participants. And, um, in particular, we were interested in MR, my background's in MR. So for uh, a number of years then we had, we uh, coupled amyloid PET with MR in our uh, participants. And we, when we measure rates of change, um, uh, what we see, what we saw when we first looked at this sort of longitudinal imaging data, we split people up by cognitive diagnosis, unimpaired, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, dementia, Surprisingly, there was basically no relationship between the rate of cognitive decline. Obviously, these people, CN, are cognitively normal, are declining at a much slower rate than the people who are fully demented. We saw no, almost no relationship 
between, at the group level, between the rate of cognitive decline and the rate of change in this biomarker, which everyone expected uh, was the driving force of the disease process. And therefore the expectation was that there would be a direct coupling of rate of change in amyloid with rate of change in, uh, uh, in uh, cognition. What we did see was several people who are cognitively normal who had quite high rates of amyloid accumulation, equivalent to what was seen in people who were fully demented. In contrast, when we looked at annual change in ventricular volume, and for people in the UK, this might be of interest because this was Nick Fox's BSI, boundary shift integral. <laughs> um, so what we did see when we looked at a different biomarker, i.e. rate of change on MR, was a very clear cut relationship that matched expectations, i.e. the rate of change in cognitive, cognitive change in people matched the rate of change in uh, brain shrinkage it did not match the rate of change in, yeah, in uh, amyloid PET. Again, this flew into the face of <laughs> expectations for uh, based on the amyloid cascade hypothesis. Now, when we get to the issue of topography, what these are maps created you know, many, many years ago. These are PIB maps, uh, PBM maps contrasting uh, people who are cognitively normal versus people who are fully demented. You can see PIB on the left-hand side and MR, atrophy, on the right-hand side. These are all people who clinically had a uh, progressive, predominantly amnestic dementia. So if you look at the picture on the left, what you should see, if there was a direct topographic relationship between the driving neuropathology, i.e. amyloid plaques, what you ought to see is a lot of atrophy in the medial temporal lobe, because that is the dominant phenotype that these people present with. And what you see is the exact opposite. There isn't very much PIB, uh, PIB deposition in the area that you would expect based on phenotypic presentation. In contrast, if you come over to the MR, you see a lot of volume loss exactly in the area of the brain where these you would expect based on phenotypic presentation. That then led to this idea that there must be a dissociation in time between time and space between, uh, uh, between onset and progression of amyloidosis and cognition, whereas there was a much more, cl much, uh, more close coupling between onset and, uh, so this would be the curve for amyloidosis, and then it's just the uh, onset of tau-related neurodegeneration was displaced in time um, and much more closely related to cognitive symptoms in time and in space, as I've shown. And so that leads to this idea that really at that time, so this was 2010, right? So it's a number of years ago. Um, probably by this point, it's close to almost 15, 14 years ago. There had to be, there have to be at least two separate classes of relevant biomarkers um, in this disease. And that would be biomarkers of amyloidosis and then biomarkers of tau-mediated neurodegeneration. Um, and that's where we came to this idea that really, if you're gonna classify people, you start needing, you have to start using these two classes of biomarkers uh, because uh, it's not the case that amyloid tells you everything, amyloid, amyloid tells you everything you need to know about what's going on in someone's brain. Now, what does this have to do with diagnostic guidelines? So. I mentioned that many research groups around the world, world started to incorporate biomarkers, multimodality biomarkers into their research programs. And it became obvious pretty quickly that they had diagnostic value. And so there were two different groups then that incorporated biomarkers into revised diagnostic criteria. So these were revised. These are really the first time since the 1980s that diagnose, people made a serious attempt to revise diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. And it was motivated by the fact that now there were biomarkers available. So there are two, two separate groups that embarked on really a series of papers uh, that uh, proposed revised diagnostic guidelines for Alzheimer's disease incorporating biomarkers. One was the IWG, International Work Group, published a series of papers. The other was the National Institute on Aging, 
Alzheimer's Association, which in 2011 impaneled three separate committees, one for unimpaired, one for mildly impaired, one for fully demented, that published three sets of guidelines. And all three of these NIAAA sets of guidelines published in 2011 employed this notion of two categories of biomarkers, biomarkers of amyloidosis and then biomarkers of tau-mediated neuronal injury or neurodegeneration. Um, and so that's where this AN classification approach arose. It arose out of the 2011 biomarker uh, NIAAA research uh, pro, uh, uh, research guidelines, three separate guidelines. And you can see these are the uh, biomarkers that were available at the time. You can see there's imaging, there's CSF based, obviously no, no uh, plasma at this point. And this is how we grouped biomarkers into the A. And at this time, N meant tau related or tau mediated neurodegeneration. So there was a direct linkage then between tauopathy both in space and time and neurodegeneration. And I mentioned that all three of the NIA 2011 NIAAA guidelines incorporated this notion of A and N classes of biomarkers. These, I'll just pan through this real quickly. This is a table from the uh, guidelines on dementia. You can see the A and the N guidelines for amount of cognitive impairment. You can see biomarkers of evaded deposition, A and N. And then finally, um, in the preclinical guidelines, actually staging of preclinical disease was based on this notion of amyloidosis, A plus and minus. Stage two then was A plus, N plus, am am amyloidosis, plus evidence of tauopathy or neurodegeneration. But now in 2013, there was a new discovery, a new, a major new uh, invention, if you will, and that was tau pet. Uh, discovered or invented by a group uh, who at the time were, at C were uh, uh, a group at Siemens led by Harpeth Cole. And um, Tau Pet be it became very obvious to everyone who started to use this in their re research programs. This was a new, uh, highly useful enabling technology. And, a, and it caused me at least to really rethink this notion of A N categorization of biomarkers. And an obvious weakness was at the time was linking tauopathy and neurodegeneration. It's true in Alzheimer's disease. The problem is neurodegeneration is nonspecific. And the solution obviously then was to break, go from AN to ATN biomarker categorization. So then you have biomarkers that are specific for aggregated AD tau. And then you have biomarkers that were specific for neurodegeneration and neuronal injury, but without conditioning this N category on a presumed association with uh, tauopathy. And that's what then led to this notion of ATN, published in neurology by this group of people here um, in 2016. And this is what the ATN uh, uh, categorization looked like. You see now there is Tau pet available. So now, if you if you uh, uh, divide biomarkers into biomarkers of A, i.e., biomarkers of plaques themselves or the associated pathophysiologic state that leads to the formation of amyloid plaques, you can see you have a CSF or a fluid-based biomarker, as well as an imaging-based biomarker in this category, in the T or tauopathy category. Similarly, the fluid-based biomarker CSF phosphorylated tau would be the biomarker of the pathophysiologic state that leads to the formation of neurofibrillary tangles and threads. Tau PET is the imaging-based uh, biomarker that maps directly onto aggregated AT, uh, AD tau. And then finally, the N category, which we placed in parentheses at this time, denoting that this is not specific for Alzheimer's disease. We break the assumption that all neurodegeneration is due to, even in someone who has Alzheimer's disease, that all neurodegeneration is due to Alzheimer's disease because of the presence of these other well-known neuropathologies uh, in the brain, any of which can be present in an individual and none of which at the time were there did biomarkers exist for. No biomarkers for Lewy body disease, TDP43, no biomarkers for microinfarcts, et cetera. 
So now we come to the next point in this outline, and that's the NIAAA research framework. So the NIAAA research framework was built on, if you will, this ATN biomarker classification. And it was, it was an update of the 2011 set, sets of guidance that was made, that was, that was, um, in, this group was impaneled by the NIA Al Alzheimer's Association to correct some of the mistakes, if you will, that were present in 2011. There were a number of inconsistencies, both conceptually and operationally between the three sets of guidelines in 2011, which made interpretation of the whole package difficult. So the attempt here was to unite all this under a single umbrella. And the core principles then of this 2018 NIAA research framework, some of them are laid out here. And that is separation of the syndrome, i.e. both the phenotypic as well as the severity of presentation um, separating that from the underlying biology. So symptoms are then regarded as a result of the disease process and not its definition. Alzheimer's, amnestic dementia and Alzheimer's disease are not synonymous. They don't mean the same thing. They don't refer to the same thing. Rather, the term Alzheimer's disease refers to pathologic change, plaques and tangles, and not to a syndrome or syndromes which are not specific for any one neuropathology. So if Alzheimer's disease then is going to be defined by the underlying neuropathology, what to do in vivo? The obvious answer is biomarkers. And, I, and as I've mentioned, um, the research framework, 2018 NIAA research framework, was built on this ATN construct. So if you have three different classes of biomarkers, A, T, and N, each one can be diagnosed dichotomized, doesn't have to be, but can be dichotomized, then that just leads to eight different permutations, plus minus permutations, which you see in this column right here, A plus, T minus, and so on. And these eight, what we called them, it was eight profiles. These can be then further lumped into three main, main categories. At the top in white, you see normal AD biomarkers, minus, minus, minus. At the bottom, in dark gray, you see three different cate biomarker categories that we would call would place people in the, the group of non-Alzheimer's pathologic change, which you see here. Then in the middle, in gray, you see biomarkers that would place an individual into the Alzheimer's continuum. And our position was that an individual had to have an A plus T plus profile with or without neurodegeneration, but A plus T plus in order to get a diagnosis or a label of Alzheimer's disease in order to that so that the in vivo definition would then be consistent with the neuropathologic gold standard. Now, you, I mentioned the name biomarker profiles. So we use the term profile as opposed to stage one because pro profiles identify people who aren't in the Alzheimer's pathologic continuum. But in reality, there was an implicit staging scheme baked into this ATN, uh, this ATN um, uh, scheme and baked into the, uh, baked into the uh, research framework. We use the term profile as opposed to stage for the reason I mentioned, also so as not to confuse people because there were clinical staging schemes as well. But the, there was an obvious staging scheme baked into these profiles. And they're illustrated in this slide here. The idea is that everyone who ultimately develops Alzheimer's disease, pathologically and clinically, starts out at some point in life as a minus, minus, minus profile. They then develop amyloidosis, A, T, A plus, T minus, N minus. They then develop tauopathy, A plus, T plus, N minus. And finally, they develop amyloidosis, they have amyloidosis, tauopathy, and neurodegeneration. So this staging scheme was really baked into it, even though we didn't use the word staging. I mentioned that we incorporated, we, we had a clinical staging scheme. We had a numeric six stage clinical staging scheme that was very similar to the old fashioned GDS, Global uh, Dementia Scale. And then we also, um, we also uh, included this uh, syndromal cognitive staging scheme. Uh, and uh, this table, is from the 2018 paper. And we deliberately laid out this table in this way to indicate the fact that cognitive stage um, is really an independent 
bit of information that is obtained from every research subject, every clinical subject, and it is related but only loosely so, so to the biomarker profile. Um, because of comorbid pathology and because of highly variable degrees of cognitive reserve among different individuals in the population, the relationship between cognitive symptoms and, all, and the biologic stage of Alzheimer's disease is there is obviously a relationship, but it's only loosely coupled. And thereby, we, I, I thought that it was a good idea, a lot of people agree, to lay out the, the staging schemes in this way so that the clinical or cognitive staging scheme was orthogonal to the uh, uh, biological staging scheme to try to convey these concepts. So for example, in someone with an Alzheimer's disease, diagnosis on the basis of biology, A plus T plus, that indivi an individual could exist anywhere along this cognitive continuum based on highly, highly uh, variable differences among individuals in the population of, in cognitive reserve, resistance, and a comor comorbid presence, absence, and severity of comorbid pathology. Likewise, if someone had was demented, even if they presented with the classic uh, uh, profile of a progressive amnestic dementia. They did not have the right biomarker profile. They didn't have Alzheimer's disease. They had something for some things, but not Alzheimer's disease. And finally, I want to point out one more thing that I think few people have picked up on, but our committee spent a long time debating this back, back in 2017, and that was the terminology. So we use the terms Alzheimer's disease with MCI, Alzheimer's disease with dementia, as opposed to dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And why did we select that, that terminology? This, the selection was made to try to convey to people the idea that if you have someone with AD based on biomarkers and you have someone who's demented based on clinical exam, you know two things with certainty. You know they have AD and you know they have dementia. What you cannot know with any degree of confidence, however, is the degree is how much copathology that person may or may not have. So you cannot know with any degree of confidence the degree to which Alzheimer's disease is responsible for the level of impairment in that person. Thereby, th that led then to this notion of, you know this, you know this, you know they both exist, but you're not, the phrasing is not making any, any sort of causal inference. So people really haven't picked up on this, but <laughs> uh, I try to emphasize it. So controversies, what were some of the controversies? Um, there were a number of controversies, but the, the biggest one was around this, and that is what is the definition of Alzheimer's disease? How should the term be used? There were really three camps um, that e emerged after the publication of the research, actually, after the publication of the 2018 research framework. Many people in the field felt, yes, the biological definition is appropriate, it's about time, um, but there were a number of people who were very vocal opponents to this. There were a number of people who took the position that the term Alzheimer's disease should really refer to all-cause dementia in older people. Uh, and they, the, the I, preference here was to basically use the 1984 definition. Anyone who had dementia was called Alzheimer's disease. And then there's the IWG position, uh, which is that Alzheimer's, you do need biomarkers, but the disease does not exist until symptoms are present. This may be more semantic than anything else, but it actually has very practical implications for clinical trials. So what is the problem with this first camp? And obviously, I'm defending this camp right here, a biological definition. What is the problem with using the term Alzheimer's disease to mean all-cause dementia in older people? At the individual person level, here's an illustration of the problem. So this is an 86-year-old woman who presented with a progressive amnestic dementia to the Mayo Clinic. Classic sort of probable Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, clinical phenotypic uh, presenta presentation. 
she had been told, her family had been told on the outside that you have Alzheimer's disease. But when she was enrolled in our, our research program, our, our research program, and we did the imaging, amyloid PET negative, tau PET negative, uh, MR, gross bilateral hippocampal atrophy. So our impression was the patient did not have Alzheimer's disease at all. Rather, she almost certainly had TDP43, which is late, more recently been christened late disease, a hippocampal sclerosis with TDP43. And in fact, the patient came to autopsy six months later, and that's exactly what was found. She had a few sparse plaques, but the, her, her impairment was due solely to late disease, not Alzheimer's disease. Um, at the clinical trial level, what is the problem with using a clinical definition of Alzheimer's disease? Everyone's familiar with this. This is, these are the publications from the phase three trials of solanuzumab and vapanuzumab. You can see the publication dates on here. These studies were initiated many years prior to this, um, early, very early 2000s, and it takes a long time to run a phase three trial. Um, but uh, as everyone is well aware, so these are both monoclonal antibodies directed against um, amyloid. Uh, neither trial met primary uh, endpoints, so they were failed trials. Um, uh, but a subset of people in both of these trials had amyloid PET, underwent amyloid PET, and about a third of the people in each of these trials, people were enrolled into these trials on the basis of the existing criteria at the time the clinical definition of probable Alzheimer's disease. About a third had amyloid PET done as a sub-study, uh, sorry, a, a number of individuals in these study, studies had amyloid PET uh, done as a sub-study, and about a third of those, the amyloid PET was negative. So what does this mean? This means that about a third of the people enrolled in both of these trials on the basis of a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease did not have the disease they were being treated for. I mean, that's, think of, I mean, can, can anyone recall a cancer trial where a third of the people um, didn't have the cancer they were being treated for? Doesn't happen, but this is, was the state of the art at the time in the early 2000s when these trials were initiated. In contrast, um, uh, more recent trials where enrollment was based on a biological definition, aducanumab, um, the lecanumab, and the, this is the phase two uh, publication from denanumab, Lilly, but we, everyone probably, I'm sure, has seen the recent um, uh, top level results from the phase three denanumab trial. Again, a major success. You can argue about aducanumab, the two, two studies, one, one positive, one uh, not, but uh, lecanumab and denanumab, um, both not only met all the primary endpoints, but the met primary clinical endpoints, but all the secondary endpoints. And um, there's a, so you can see the difference in outcomes when you enroll based on a clinical definition versus a biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. Now, the second group that had some objections, had objections to the NIAAA research framework was the IWG. These are a series of publications by the um, IWG. People are quite familiar with this. And it's probably, it may be confusing to people in the, in, in the field. What is the difference between the NIAAA position and the IWG position? And that I think is very easily encapsulated in this slide. If you look at this series of curves here, you see that there's an onset of uh, uh, biomarkers. Now we see amyloid PET, but also we see fluid biomarkers, both um, CSF and, and uh, plasma that uh, correlate very closely in time with the onset of amyloidosis. And then later uh, uh, biomarkers, tau PET, MRI, et cetera, that uh, become abnormal at some distance from the initial onset of amyloidosis. And onset of clinical symptoms denoted by this curve right here is much more closely tied both in space and time to tell off at the end of our degeneration. But there is this gap estimated to be anywhere from 15, around 15 years or so between the onset of amyloidosis and the onset of clinical symptoms. And the NIAAA takes the position 
that in this 15 year period gap, people who exist in that gap have Alzheimer's disease. There are risk for symptoms. They live long enough to develop symptoms, but they have the disease and they're at risk for symptoms. In contrast, the IWG takes the position that someone who has a head full of amyloid does not have Alzheimer's disease. They are at risk for Alzheimer's disease because the definition of the disease has to be accompanied by symptoms. And that's really the fundamental difference between the two. Um, and when pressed, the IWG group will say, well, the, the reason we take this position is that the risk of developing symptoms in an asymptomatic person who has amyloidosis is far too low to label those individuals as having a disease. So is that true? Here's a study by um, the Amsterdam group, and I'll run through a series of papers. I might skip over some, one or two of these, but for the sake of time, but here's a, a series of papers that, that, that uh, rebut exactly what I just said the IWG position is. So this is um, a group of individuals with subjective cognitive decline entered into the Am Amsterdam uh, longitudinal uh, study, but all were classified as cognitively normal. The uh, Amsterdam group uh, uh, assigned people to their ATN um, biomarker profile groups and then estimated uh, the, uh, or measured, if you will, the uh, hazard ratios for progression to dementia and then progression to either MCI or dementia as a function of their uh, ATN biomarker groups. The reference group to form the hazard ratios was the minus, minus, minus group. What do you see? You see that the group who is plus, 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 cognitively normal, but plus, 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 has a 60 times greater rate of progression to dementia in comparison to the minus, minus, minus reference group. Now, ask yourself, does this seem like a low risk proposition? It does not to me. It, at Mayo, we looked at the association of these ATN uh, profiles with rates of memory decline in a large group of people. And these are the, uh, as a function of the eight different biomarker uh, profile groups, ATN profile groups. These are selected, scatter, randomly selected scatter plots from the eight different groups. This is the minus, minus, minus group. This is the plus, plus, plus group. These are uh, randomly selected uh, spaghetti plots so you can see individual trajectories. The main data is in this slide in these four plots here. You can see that the annualized rate of change in a memory composite scores on the x-axis. You can see and zero denotes no change, so negative values denote decline. The eight different um, biomarker profiles are uh, in the rows, and you can see three different e exemplar ages were examined, it pulled out from the model, 65, 75, 85. E4 carriers and non-carriers appear right on top of one another. And three of these biomarker profiles really stand out. It's the bottom three as having the highest, by far, the highest rates of change. And it doesn't matter, age is irrelevant, or not irrelevant, but it's true for regardless of age, it's true regardless of sex, it's true regardless of APOE genotype. If you're in one of three, these three groups, your rates of decline on memory are fastest. And what are those three groups? They are groups with amyloidosis coupled with either telepathy or neurodegeneration. So rate of change in a memory composite may not be something that is, is uh, obviously meaning, clinically meaningful to a lot of people. But since age and APOE were in the model, we can scale the effect size of these biomarker profiles um, against age, the effect of age, and the effect of E4 on the rate of memory decline. And what we see is that in comparison to the minus, minus, minus reference group, individuals who sit in the, in these three high rate groups the effect of uh, abnormal biomarkers is equivalent to a 20 year increase in age. Stop and think about that for a second. If, you, you know, if, if you're in your 60 years old or 65 years old, would you want your brain to, to magically age 20 years uh, 
probably no probably the answer is no that's something most people can uh, relate to and the effect is twice that of being an apple weed carrier this is a paper from rick osenkoppel led this it was uh, a pooled analysis from seven different cohorts the actually the largest contributor to this analysis was us the mayo clinic um, uh, but looked at divided people up uh, into a minus t minus a plus t plus etc and again relative to the reference minus minus group these are all cognitively unimpaired individuals the um, uh, hazard ratio of progression to mci or progression to all cause dementia was 20 in the plus plus group and 40 in the uh, for all to progression to all cause dementia. Again, having abnormal biomarkers in an unimpaired person is not a benign condition, but yet that is the basis for the IWG uh, position. And a very similar analysis, and we'll go through this in a lot of detail. You can see the pool analysis from four different cohorts led by um, this uh, woman at the um, uh, McGill University. The Kaplan Meyer plots, and probably no surprise, the group with the fastest rates of decline in every study was the A plus T plus group. So I'll come to the end here with this uh, notion of integrating plasma biomarkers into the NIAAA research framework. So a major limitation of the 2018 framework was that at the time, the only disease-specific biomarkers required either PET imaging or CSF analysis. And uh, um, by definition then, uh, CSF and PET, they're invasive or expensive. And then by definition, that this limited the idea of a biomarker-based definition of Alzheimer's disease to specialty clin clinics or clinical trials. It was not applic applicable in general medicine. The obvious solution was is plasma biomarkers, which did not exist at the time, but very shortly after the uh, after the research framework document was put together, papers started to appear in the literature indicating good performance of plasma biomarkers in the A or amyloid category, good performance of plasma biomarkers in the T category, particularly PTAL 217-181 and more recently 231 and good performance of biomarkers in the N or nerve degeneration neuronal injury category, particularly neurofilament light. So this is my last slide. Um, the conclusion is that Alzheimer's disease is a continuum and the disease begins with the appearance of brain pathology in people who are asymptomatic. And it ends with, a, with symptomatic people who have the full biomarker profile, A plus, T plus, and N plus. The disease does not start when symptoms begin. A biological definition is necessary for both accurate diagnosis and for targeted therapy. However, the 2018 research framework has to be updated to one, incorporate plasma biomarkers, and two, improve clinical applic applicability because the system really has to work in what almost everyone in the field now believes is the era of uh, disease modifying treatments. So, and in fact, may not be a secret any longer at this point, but the um, uh, a uh, research, a, a group has been convened and is in the process of, by the NIAAA and is in the process of updating this uh, framework. And in fact, there'll be a session at the AAIC this July, Sunday afternoon, <laughs> describing what the committee has come up with. So that's my last slide, and I appreciate the opportunity to present this material and uh, welcome any questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Cliff. That was an excellent. Um, uh, summary and history of uh, of the ATN biomarker framework and really brought us bang up to date with current controversies and uh, and debates. So uh, 
uh, since we, uh, if, if it's okay, I think maybe you have a few minutes extra beyond the, the top of the hour. So we'll take that since we were a bit staggered to start with. Um, and I'll, I'll open up some questions to the rest of the team. Uh, Omar, I see your hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jack, for your for your discussion. Um, quite an interesting perspective on the controversy between the IWG stance and the NIAA uh, framework in terms of the definition for AD. My question is really about, do you see a future where the two positions could converge? And secondly, oh. OK, well, that answers that. That's OK. And and. My second question, maybe you'll probably expand on, on the note slightly later, but my second part of the first question is, how unique is this difference in terms of definition of a disease when you compare it to other neurological disorders? And then generally, when you compare it to other, other disease conditions, so is this a unique position just for Alzheimer's? No. So in fact, so thanks for, thanks for these questions. So to get back to your first question, I don't, I don't see, I don't see any notion of, comp I, I don't see any, I don't see the two coming together. And okay. the reason is there is just this fundamental disagreement about what a disease is. Um, and, you know, if, if, you know, if the IWG, I think it's actually an individual, right? <laughs> or a, a couple of individuals in the IWG, because interestingly, uh, it, you know, I don't want to call out people, but for example, Kai Lenau is one of the authors of the IWG. He doesn't believe, I can tell you, he's a good friend of mine. He doesn't believe that the disease begins when symptoms begin. I mean, um, so I think it's an individual or a couple of individuals that, in the IWG group who take this position, you know, that the you have to have observable symptoms in order to label someone as having a disease. And um, that's not the NI, it's not our group's position. And we just think it's fun, it's fundamentally wrong. And if you think something, if, you know, the, the stakes are in the ground and there's, yeah. anyway, I, I don't see, I don't see a unification is, is the answer to your question. So, um, our position with the NIA is we just move forward, um, uh, modernizing the criteria to incorporate the latest developments in biomarkers. That's our position. Um, other diseases. Um, so uh, it's, it's very interesting that, I mean, look at any other disease. And if you have a biomarker of that disease, it's called a disease, whether or not someone has symptoms, right? If someone has a cancer identified on screening mammography, who is completely asymptomatic, they've never felt a lump, do they not have breast cancer? You know, if someone has a tumor in the colon on screening colonoscopy, they've never had a symptom in their life. Do they not have a disease until they, start up, until they have colonic obstruction? Of course not. Diabetes, the vast majority of people with type 2 diabetes are diagnosed on screening hemoglobin A1C, who are they're asymptomatic. They're not diagnosed because they show up in an ER in diabetic ketoacidosis. That, um, and I could go on and on. Kidney, you know, chronic kidney disease. Right? Most people with chronic, chronic kidney disease are diagnosed on the basis of a, a screen that identifies uh, impaired uh, glomerular GFR. So I, I could go on and on, but the standard in medicine is that if you have a diagnostic test for a disease, you diagnose a disease, um, whether or not someone's symptomatic. And to me, it has always seemed very odd that, all, that dementia or Alzheimer's disease should be placed in a different category. Yeah. Um, and when I've pressed, when I've pressed people, you know, there have been obviously debates about this. And when I press people um, in the IWG group, their their only fallback is, well, the risk of having positive biomarkers 
in being asymptomatic, the risk of developing symptoms is too low to consider it a disease. We don't want to upset people. But the reality is, I mean, you saw some of the hazard ratios. A hazard ratio of 60. I mean, where in medicine do you see a hazard ratio of 60? People get excited if there's a hazard ratio of two or three. <laughs> for every one person who is minus, minus, minus in the Amsterdam group, for every one person who was unimpaired, minus, minus, minus at baseline, who progressed to dementia, 60 progressed to dementia who were you know, in the plus, plus, plus group. So the idea that being asymptomatic and having biomar positive biomarkers is a low risk proposition, to me, completely flies in the face of data. Anyway, thank you. Long -winded explanation. No, no, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Stephen, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'm going to give airtime. Obviously, you know, I don't want to hog all the action. I, uh, no, I, so. I, have to say, I really don't have anything pressing. So as long as people want to stay on, I'm happy oh, okay. to. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. We'll, we'll take advantage of that. Thanks. Um, Jed, I think you've got a question. Um, yeah, following on from that, really, talking about the, the very high risk of people who are A plus T plus, um, to what extent is that reliant on, on tau PET um, rather than fluid markers of tau? And is, is that partly why in your most recent um, Lancet Neurology version, you've, you've kind of separated those curves out quite quite substantially? Yeah, it does. And so the, the um, and that this is one of the things that were, this is one of the corrections to the NIAA research framework, this whole ATN that has to, that is, that is uh, in process, right? And that's to break the assumption of equivalence between fluid and imaging. So we've said from the beginning, you know, way back in whenever, you know, 2015, when we were, this group was first putting together this ATN white paper, that just take well, tau is where the biggest temporal discrepancy occurs. And if you, you know, it, it, with a fluid measure, you're you know you're measuring phosphorylated tau fragments. I mean, those are the building blocks that go to form neuro, you know, neurofil threads and neuro, neurofibular tangles. So they're obviously related to each other. But does the detect, detection sensitivity of PET match? The detection sensitivity of fluid when in order to see something on PET, the disease has to have been progressed, you have to have aggregated enough neurofibrillary tangles to, to you to have significant binding with the top PET ligand. The answer is no. So we have to break this assumption of equivalence between fluid and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, imaging. And the reality is that you can detect fluid tau biomarkers, the phosphor tau, at a much earlier stage than you can tau PET. And it's tau PET that maps on to, most closely maps on to clinical symptoms. So there is a temporal discrepancy. Someone who has only an abnormal uh, plasma or CSF P tau, but a normal tau PET, someone with an abnormal tau PET is a lot closer in time to have experiencing symptoms than someone who has a normal top bed and um, uh, but abnormal uh, fluid. So, yeah. Thank you. And um, if I may, another related question. So again, on this topic of kind of separating um, curves, uh, there was a version of your, your curves um, published from um, Nick Fox's group from um, Philip Western in 2015, where they separated the uh, curve that I think you'd call um, brain structure at the time um, into uh, an earlier microstructure curve and a later macrostructure curve. And I, I wondered um, what your thoughts were on, on that separation. I mean, there have been all kinds of, you know, kind of variations of this whole thing. I mean, there are people who want to separate out FTG, pull FTG to the left because it's more, it, it really all depends on the sensitivity of the assay or the sensitivity of the the measurement technique, if you're talking about imaging, to the underlying, uh, to, to the underlying uh, neuropathologic disease process. It's, t it's entirely conceivable. And today, even, there is this notion that sort of high, you know, high level uh, uh, diffusion tensor naughty 
for example, analytics, are going to be more sensitive to microstructural, ch microstructural change than macrostructural shrinkage of cortex or shrinkage of volume. And thereby, that curve should be sh shifted to the left. Entirely possible. It, it, it all depends on the, the sensitivity of the assay. Thank you. I mean, this, I mean, I, I don't know how familiar people are with fluid, with, you know, with plasma assays. But I mean, there is this controversy. Does, you know, two, 231, you know, phosphorylation at, at the 231 position precede 217? And is, is there a distinct ordering, 231, then 217, then 181? Well, oh, maybe, or it could just be that the assay is better, <laughs> and they all kind of, you know, and there's an upregulation of of phosphorylation at all at, at all these sites, and and it just happens that the 231 assay is a little more has a little less noise in it, so you can detect it's crossing whatever the threshold is with a little better precision. So, anyway, thanks, thanks for those. Thank, thanks for those comments. Actually, I, I would just uh, add some comment on the microstructure, macrostructure consideration that Jed was referring to, because, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you're, you're aware, um, but my background is in uh, neuropathology originally. So uh, a bit like you were saying about, you know, your ancestors are in England, my sort of heritage is, is, is actually in uh, neuropathology. And I'm delighted to, to, to see in the, in the early parts of your history, you know, what a, what a prominent role that makes. And I think that it's still very important to be able to track back to what you can see at autopsy and, and you know in through the microscope in in the brain. So I've always had this uh, strong conviction that obviously if we can see the microstructure and that that relates to your point about sensitivity of the actual uh, assessment method, but if we can detect uh, a change at that level, then we should gain traction on the on the question much much earlier in the process. Uh, and so I think we we certainly take the view because we have a we do have a diffusion-based uh, approach. It's not it's not noddy, but we have our own approach, which is which is a sort of similarly we would say kind of separates the curves as it were and and, and gains access to microstructural change uh, somewhat earlier in the process, which I think is uh, powerful. Um, and, and and further to that, um, in terms of the sort of sort of separation in time, which was which was sort of one of the insights that you you had earlier on in order to to construct these curves. I'm also very interested in well, I'm interested in the question of how sort of how wide uh, the separation of these different curves should be. I think, as kind of as you were alluding to, in order to you know perhaps update your model and and define the curve separately, and in and and in particular how that relates to something that you mentioned a couple of times, which is uh, cognitive reserve or resistance or those sorts of things, because it strikes me that. Uh, you know, at least at the microstructural level, at the microscopic level, uh, you might expect to see um, uh, dystrophic neurites and that sort of thing really quite early on in the process. So you could say, well, there's a there's a structural change in the brain happening soon after amyloid is is is, is accumulating and so forth, or indeed uh, inflammatory change. And I would I just wonder if actually cognitive reserve is a much wider spread across across that. I think in your latest model. It sort of appears a little bit at the end, but I just wonder actually if it sort of potentially is a bit of an interference all the way, you know, quite far across those curves. I just wondered what your comments or thoughts would be on that. Both the both the points that you raise, we one I agree with everything you said. Two, um, we've tried to incorporate it into this into these models, but I mean, the point you the the point about. The, the point you're making about much greater sensitivity of neuropathology than anything that has been or realistically ever will be available in vivo, that's what we've tried to, what I've tried to indicate with this detection threshold. The reality is that this detection threshold, I mean, it might be up here, <laughs> but then it's just hard to draw the, draw this stuff on here. But the reality is, as you, point, as you, you, know, have, you have correctly pointed out, there's there's so much sensitive structural and molecular change that are, that sits that the neuropathologists can see that in vivo biomarkers can't see and realistically will never see. There's so much that sits, you know, in here that I, I think this is a limitation that people who aren't so familiar with biomarkers fail to appreciate. But the field, everyone 
who, who wind up using biomarkers, whether they're imaging or fluid, really ought to appreciate. And I have to say that's something that I tried to emphasize in the 2018 document. It's going to be re-emphasized in the one we're working on now, but it's completely right. I mean, the second thing is, you know, better assay. So where does something cross this detection threshold line? I mean, it's a function of two things, right? It's a function of the underlying biology, but it's also just a function of the assay precision and sensitivity. And you can have two different assays of the same, exactly the same thing, and one will look like it's shifted in time just because mm. the assay is crappy. Mm. Um, as far as cognitive reserve, totally agree. So really there, there are, I mean, you could think of that's what this bit of the yeah. diagram is intended to, I mean, this is intended to represent and you can you can think of it I, I, the way I think of it is in three the inner individual response to neuropathology in three buckets three conceptual buckets one you know one is that um, for an identical level of Alzheimer's neuro, neuropathology and an identical point position in time if you will with respect to the temporal evolution of that Alzheimer's pathology. A person that has additional comorbidities is going to be shifted to the left. So their cognitive cur curve is going to be shifted to the left. And as you point out, they may be shifted way to the left. Mm -hmm. So someone with someone with late disease can be right here, amyloid, um, you know, am have you know a, a head full of amyloid, but no down very little downstream pathology. They can be fully demented their cognitive position could be shifted here by the superimposed presence of TDP43. So, mm. it, but again, it's just hard to draw this kind sure. of thing. Yeah. And, and then the other thing, so the high reserve really, you know, I think of it in two different components. You know, one, one is strictly the result of, one is, one is the result of, for lack of anything better, genetically uh, genetically endowed resistance to pathology. So you've seen, I'm sure you've seen the, as a neuropathologist, I'm sure you've seen these papers that have looked at individuals who were cognitively normal in life, but they have a lot of, you know, plaques and tangles. Mm. And it, it does appear that there is, there, there, as you know, I'm mean, telling you, you probably know this much better than I do. I mean, there are, subtle uh, ultra uh, uh, histologic differences I mean, there's mislocation of certain peptides to the you know in the axonal in the terminals in people who are demented and they're not there in people who aren't who have the same you know macroscopic if you will level of neuropathology so mm -hmm. absolutely there there have to be genetically determined differences in the uh, reserve uh, resistance if you will to an existing load of Alzheimer's pathology. And then the final thing is people with a lot of education, a high, you know, high functioning jobs um, who are shifted to the right. Mm. So that's kind of how I think about this. And you're right. I mean, this could, <laughs> this, <clears throat> a head full of uh, TDP43 is going to shift someone way, way to the left. And so, but it's just hard to draw that kind of. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I, I asked sort of multiple questions all at once there, so I've, I've I've taken over a bit. Go on. Let's let's have a couple more questions if there's time from people on the team here. Yeah, Jamie. Uh, J Jamie. Yeah, I, I saw before Mario. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I was just wondering if you could comment on the kind of importance of comorbidities in both like alongside Alzheimer's, um, both from a drug development point of view and also in practice. Your voice cut out right at a key part. So ah. the importance of something. Comorbidities <laughs> alongside Alzheimer's. Comorbid? Comorbidities, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is, this is, this is a big, it's a big controversy, if you will. Um, in the, 
both within the US FDA and also in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it is a lot, it is a lot simpler, if you will, to pretend that someone who has, a, you know, a, a, an amyloid PET scan with a given SUVR value and who has a given level of cognitive impairment, that that co level of cognitive impairment is due solely to Alzheimer's disease. And to pretend that if you, if you conduct, if you do a trial based on a positive amyloid PET scan, or even let's say a, 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 a SCBR range or a senoloid range, people who are in a certain senoloid range and a certain level of cognitive impairment that you've created a homogeneous group that is expected to respond in a similar fashion to an intervention. It's simple to pretend that, but the reality is it's not true. And that, and so I think that, um, well, that's not a good example. So uh, I don't, I don't actually have some examples, but I don't, it's not easy. Pretend for a minute, this person right here, this is a grossly positive amyloid PET scan. The person was demented, amnestic dementia, grossly positive amyloid PET scan, atrophy, but uh, a negative tau PET scan. This person would qualify for enrollment, would have qualified for enrollment in the um, Lecanemab trial um, uh, and would have you know, met all the enrollment criteria. Would you expect this person to, however, to respond to very well cognitively to um, uh, an anti-amyloid uh, antibody? I wouldn't, and so the, <laughs> this is the key. this is the key. I mean, the odds of this person if let's pretend the amyloid PET scan was positive, top PET negative though, really prominent atrophy. It's obvious that because of the mismatch in neurodegeneration telepathy, that there's something else going on, and in all likelihood, that something else is one TDP43, and two, it's the dominant cause of this person's impairment. It's in my view, it's very unlikely that this person would respond to a monoclonal antibody cognitively and should not, <clears throat> should not be enrolled in a trial. And that this picture should be an exclusionary criteria for enrollment in a monoclonal uh, uh, anti-amyloid trial. This is controversial though. So I think you've hit on a re really important thing, but um, <laughs> it's controversial. <laughs> it's controversial because it makes life difficult, right? Because yeah. what this what this means is you really need a fairly deep phenotyping in, in order to properly enroll people into trials. If you really want to create homogeneous groups that you, you can realistically expect to respond in a similar way to an intervention, and um, you have to screen a whole lot more people. Uh, in order to get people who you know, fall into your, who meet the screen criteria, then it becomes a lot more expensive. So, um, and I guess that differs then quite a lot then in practice when you need to treat the person yeah. rather than you can't you can't pick who you treat. You have to kind of well treat I mean, these comorbidities, right? Yeah, and you know, so it's controversial at the FDA. It's controversy in pharmaceutical companies because one, you you have to screen a whole lot more people. It becomes way more expensive, and two, the registration label for the drug then becomes quite a bit narrower mm. because you have to inclusion criteria includes. Uh, so let, let's just take the the criteria for denanamab or lecanemab. There's a clinical criteria. There's and amyloid positive, but now if you superimpose this idea that you can't have this big discrepancy in neurodegeneration tauopathy, someone's got to have a little tauopathy in order to qualify. Um, that narrows the label that you that you can receive from a regulator considerably. Mm. So that's <laughs> there's not a whole lot of enthusiasm on the part of the pharmaceutical industry for narrowing the label. <laughs> Yeah, creates these sort of pragmatic practical uh, barriers as well in some ways. Um,
Yeah, so maybe one more question. I think, well, Mario, you, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't take you up. So you go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your great presentation. I have a question about the neurodegeneration. Um, so some measure neurodegeneration, including uh, volume, cortical thickness, and cortical diffusivity can be affected by inflammatory responses to amyloid deposition. So could you comment on the challenges of distinguishing neuroinflammation and uh, neurodegeneration? The, the challenge is there aren't many, there aren't really good, you know, biomarkers of neuro, neurodegeneration. So yes, there are PET ligands, you know, TSPO ligands, but there are, you know, problems around that. The reality is that PET, you know, PET ligands from activated microglia have been around for a long time and they, you know, if something really works, it's going to catch on, but they, have, they haven't caught on, and that, there's a reason for that. Um, um, so let's just take pet uh, uh, biomarkers for, for uh, activated microglia off the table for a second. Um, you know, you have uh, CSF TREM2, or it's a CSF assay. Again, not something that's going to be really widely available. Um, plasma GFAP actually looks quite good. So plasma GFAP is a putative mark, biomarker of astrocytic activation. And it actually looks quite good. It changes early. Um, and it actually predicts cognitive decline pretty well. We're, I'm just working on a paper right now, as I can tell you. <laughs> but um, it, it's 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 pretty good, not as good as PTAL217, but it, it is quite good. So the problem is there just have not been, there, there are not that many great biomarkers available that can be incorporated into, easily incorporated into longitudinal studies to really figure out what is the temporal and spatial, well, spatial relationships, but temporal relationships between a good biomarker of inflammation and a, a neurodegeneration. But your question is right on the money. There's tons of interest in that in the field. Um, I mean, if you look at, I, I, I wouldn't be able to find it in a fast, snappy way, but I mean, if you look at the, so Jeff Cummings, every year or every couple of years, he publishes just an overview of the status of uh, F or trial, FDA registered trials. And think it's divided up into what's small molecule, what's a biologic, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then the target. And there are a number of earlier trials now that are targeting various inflammation mechanisms. There's a lot of interest in this because the role of inflammation is becoming really obvious. Problem is there just are not good biomarkers. It's not like amyloidosis where you've got good fluid biomarkers, you've got good pet biomarkers, um, but anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Cliff. So I think we should draw the Q&A uh, to a close there. It just remains for me to thank you for a, a really excellent overview of, of um, where we've got to with uh, biomarkers for Alzheimer's and, and uh, you know, to some extent, the overlapping conditions and, of course, how we've got here. And I think that it really defines uh, very much the modern era in terms of, you know, how new drugs will be uh, investigated. Uh, drug trials will be uh, constructed. And of course, with the new era of, of actual treatments becoming available, I think, uh, you know, really defines how we approach that clinically. So uh, really, really exciting. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for talking to us today. Delighted to have had the opportunity to talk and interact.